I thank you for that introduction, and I just wanted to say that um, putting, I'd like to sort of address the general issue of how we get smarter and cleverer, more technologically advanced, and seem to understand less and less about the really important things, that, uh, the problems that we face. I suggest that we are witnessing a dismantling of the NHS in the UK, possibly the finest policy product ever uh, of social democracy, uh, the largest employer, non-civilian, the civilian employer in Europe, um, set up to address perhaps the cruelest of inequalities, which is health inequality, um, and we are seeing it dismantled. We're seeing a land grab. And we try to understand that. That's a very strange and difficult thing to understand. And I know that you will be given many rational arguments, and we are in, indeed in the media, given arguments for privatization and against privatization. Um, and that this is, you know, we use these arguments to try to understand why this is occurring. I want to say in my talk, which is going to be brief today, that those arguments are invalid that that's not why we do things. It isn't based on rationality, and it's a little bit more complex than that. Actually, it is based on the distortions of perception. And I want to talk about distortions of perception. In particular, I want to talk about the distortions of perception that occur when you gain power and seek to hold it. The other thing we don't understand is why it is being the privatization of the NHS and the dismantling of this fantastic policy product is being allowed to occur. I suggest that actually many of you are involved in this organization because you want to resist that and you want to protect the NHS. So the other thing I want to ask is why is it why are they getting away with it? Why do we allow this to happen? when it is so blatantly not based on rational argumentation. Now I suggest to you that when you look at how power corrupts, which I have done in great detail and will not bore you with today, you will see that it doesn't just affect leaders, it also affects followers, subordinates and citizens. And what we're seeing today is an advancement of that age-old political problem which is corruption by power. And we'll explore a little bit of that in terms of how it impacts on what we're trying to understand today, which, as I understand it, is the dismantling of the welfare state and particularly the NHS. So the first argument that we're given is that the NHS is hopelessly inefficient. Right? We're given this argument. You can do statistics. You listen to Reed Hansard. It's, it's, all, it's absolutely available to you. If you want the evidence for the fact that the NHS does not work, you will find it everywhere. You are being force-fed this evidence in the media. The evidence is accelerating precisely because money is being starved into the system, so it's underfunded, it's understaffed, and then we get to turn around and say the A&Es aren't working. So this is a manufactured and deeply ideological project to shrink the state to shrink away from the safety nets of what were traditionally liberal democracy and to let you float on your own. And that's why the kind of fear that we experience around poverty, some of the things that Kate was talking about, is so extraordinary today. It's not just about whether you're going to get work. It's actually about whether you're going to get work to make money so that you can deal with your health problems. This is a very, very serious issue that's being presented to us. So the inefficiency argument, I would suggest, is that the public sector does not work. Indeed, it's very difficult now to defend the public sector. I don't know if you've noticed that. It's really hard to say, well, you know, it's not just... You could use the word happiness or well-being, but, I mean, what are we going to say? I mean, it's all about the money. The whole argument is about the nature of value in our society today. Value is monodimensional, and everything can be reduced to that dimension, the dimension of money. Universities are experiencing exactly the same thing. What's the point of a university education? There isn't one if you measure it in terms of money. I mean, you can actually make some clever arguments, but you, we all know that there's a lot of other things going on other than just making money. It's the same thing with health. So I would suggest that actually it becomes more and more difficult 
in this ideological environment where value is monodimensional to a, give the value of a public sector. So then the argument is, look, there's only one way to coordinate human activity. The only way to do it is the discipline of the market. The market will organize us like an invisible hand, Adam Smith, a spontaneous order uh, from Hayek, fabulous arguments, very clever arguments. And it does work on the iPhone, it does. You get a better phone from a market, but you might not want the market to actually look after your grandmother. And the fact that we live in a system that cannot distinguish between those two projects is a very constricted environment. How are we to understand when the type, the concepts that we're given are so distorted? Now, one of the things is a bit of a sociologist as a part-time. You know, sociologists tell you things you already know in language you can't understand. You know that line? Well, let, let me do a little bit of that because another possible argument would be actually this is what's going on here. The reason this is happening is that there's a much larger societal change taking place, that capitalism, that thing up there, is actually evolving in different kinds of ways. So we've already heard about individuation. We, we could talk about commodification. Everything is being reduced to the value of a commodity. And you could say things like, we are learning even in um, the looking after of our grandmother to measure progress in terms of uh, uh, key indicators, metrics, very simple numbers, the reduction of everything to the, the notion of economic value. So you could say that actually that's a larger project and what's happening is something, a sort of a rationalization of society so that everything is just turning into administration and pretty soon we're going to be wearing pieces of computing that tell us how to do everything and it, it, this is a kind of a nightmare scenario of the, what Weber once called the iron cage of administration. So that we, in fact, you know, people like bus drivers, I, know, I don't know if you know this, I don't know what Leeds bus drivers are like, as I remember them, they're fairly wild. But in London, bus drivers are now the most inspected human beings on the planet. Every time they accelerate, every time they brake, anything they do is measured and fed back to them. And there are performance indicators and they're paid according to that. So you could say that this is a process of late capitalism, Here we, this is the way sociologists talk, and there are these very wide-ranging social processes of rationalisation of our society. That's a weird way of talking about it though, because there's not a heck of a lot we can do about it. It's like globalisation, austerity. These are things that are given to you like a wrathful god of the Middle Ages. There's nothing that you can do. So just bow down and take the medicine. There's nothing we can do. We can't, how do you fight global capitalism? I mean, where do you start? Where do you end? Another way of thinking about this might be that actually what we're seeing is a little bit simpler than that. That was a little bit too much sociology. What we really need is a bit more management science. Uh, you couldn't get any simpler than that, could you? Management science, uh, would tell us that actually we've got some sort of crisis of leadership going on today. And it's really impossible to actually manage anything because, you know, we've got transnational corporations and we've got uh, uh, these sort of withering states and everything's so complex, complexity theory, you know, chaos. It's very difficult to be a leader today. And at that point, that's strange because the part of the crisis of leadership seems to be that we are getting the same kind of leaders in the public, the private sectors, in government and in CEOs. They're the same kind of leaders and interestingly they use the same methods. They're all like, they're all trained at McKinsey or the Judge Business School in Cambridge. You know, they all use the same methods of doing things. I think you could look at the idea of a privileged managerial class that is emerging um, around us that increasingly doesn't need us in the production process, that actually Middlesbrough is not necessary anymore. And what we need to do is to simply develop the southeast and call it economic growth. 
Um, and that would be, you know, a good idea if it worked. I mean, I don't think the people in Middlesbrough, you know, they tend to kind of come wandering down, you know, when you do that to them. Um, but I think that um, you can see this. We look, we watch, um, you know, on television, we watch people systematically lying to camera about these kinds of problems. We watch politicians who, who are so separated from the experience of healthcare and the reception of healthcare. I mean, my background was in mental health work. You get told by a professional or a politician that everything's fine, that we have something called a discharge plan. I always remember this. And then the next day, I get a call, 2 o'clock in the morning, the guy's been discharged from mental hospital, and there's no plan. He's holding his plan, actually. He had a plan, but he didn't have anything. There was no pr provision. The gap that emerges between this privileged class and the rest of us is a perceptual distortion. It's not looking at the real world. This is not about rational argumentation. There's something else going on. We have a land grab that's not being resisted. We have the separation of a privileged elite class. We have a total falling away of democratic accountability so that we can no longer act on the problems that we face. We have lying and consequently we have cruelty. And when you watch television you see avoidable suffering. It's not just that it's suffering, it's that you keep wanting to ask yourself, why can't we do something about it? I can make an iPhone. Why can't I deal with this simple problem? Apparently simple problem. One way I'm going to suggest to you that we could understand this would be to look at the idea of what happens to human beings as they separate and become unequal. As hierarchy dominates social relations. And I think that, that you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's what my book is about. And what I try to say in the book is how that works in terms of cognitive science and neurobiology. But I'm not going to bore you with that. What I am going to say to you is how could you actually tell if this is happening to somebody? In other words, what are the clinical indicators of corruption by power? Let me say it again. What are the symptoms of hubris? Right? Hubris being the ancient Greek word for vain glory. Well, the symptoms you can read, I've read everything on this, and I boiled it down. I boiled it down to four. And the four are, I suggest to you, absolutely evident in my, one of my favourites at the moment is uh, Hunt, the health secretary. <laughs> if you look at his face, he's gone. Right? It's because, you know, the power has just gone to his head. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what that looks like in a leader, but make no mistake, when you go work, you'll see this isn't just Tiberius we're talking about. It's not just Tony Blair. It's all over society in tin pot dictators, in offices, families, and indeed everyday life. So this is a serious problem. The problem manifests itself in the following way. An expansion of the self, a growth of narcissistic arrogance, a belief that I can do anything that I want and it's for the best of all of us. Hunt is totally unable to distinguish between his own interests and the interests of the people he represents. There was a lovely dis discussion he had about Murdoch and regulating Murdoch, in which he sort of said, well, I quite like Murdoch, you know, but it won't, be, it won't affect my judgment about you know, regulating the press. It was just lovely. The belief that you are uniquely powerful. Now look, you've all felt this. Almost everybody has this feeling at some point. Right? So power inequality takes place across human society. So well, it's quite good to actually think about what it means for you. And you start to think, OK, well, you know, if I'm getting a little bit inflated here, if I'm getting a little bit overconfident, maybe that's the first sign. Uh, by the way, you better be quick, because once this starts to go, and you've seen this in people and you'll see this in leaders, it's very difficult to stop. So what you get is an inflation of the self, 
you then get a growing contempt for other people. A contempt for the idiots that surround you, who won't get involved and help you out, who won't take responsibility. The shirkers, the plebs. I love that word. That's an old word. Whatever policeman made that up to get Mitchell. Beautiful. <laughs> So you've got these, this is a, another thing, a contempt for the workers at the, wor at the coal face themselves. Like, you know, it's the teachers and the, uh, they're wrong, it's the nurses they're wrong, it's the academics they're wrong, although sometimes they are, and it's all about, the, you know, a, a contempt for, the se for, the, for subordinates. You also get a separation. You get a separation, which we've talked about already, between uh, the, uh, in other words, you get an isolated group, like around somebody like Mubarak who would go to an entire town in Sharm el-Sheikh where he had no contact with the human beings, other human beings at all, just yes men and sycophants. And you start to see that separation that we've already talked about, which I think you're now seeing in management structures within the NHS and also in the governance of the UK. And finally, and most importantly, you need to realise that these people are not lying. They really believe what they say. And that's because they have no idea that they are corrupted by power. It goes below consciousness and you do not know. Consequently, you cannot do therapy with these people because they say, what do you mean? I'm fine. You're the one with the problem. I'm feeling great. I'm excited. I'm doing things. I'm responsible. I'm making money. So it's a very difficult thing to treat. Now, I think that you can also see this uh, corruption by power in terms of the effect on subordinate populations. You can see it in terms of the growth of dependency and what uh, Seligman has called learned helplessness, where we simply stand there and just say, I don't know what to do. I'm being led by a corrupted leader. I have no perception of my own agency. So there's a tremendous growth of dependency, sometimes referred to as blind obedience, that occurs in a subordinate group. This is an unusual thing to say in the modern world, that corruption affects both leader and follower. But in the ancient world, this was well known, that it also had this strangely double effect. And this is why People do not resist the land grab that is taking place today. Because they do not feel they have that kind of power or control or agency. It's been taken away from them. Now, the lack of public outrage will continue until there is simply too much pressure on it. In other words, till the last minute there will be silence. And then slowly things will begin to happen. So when Kate mentioned today, like, well, what is to be done? I'm not sure that much is to be done by um, the UNDP or by um, groups of, uh, of politicians. Because democracy and the history of democracy does not, shows you very clearly that these rights and privileges are not given by kind elites. They are wrested from elites by very annoyed people from Middlesbrough, right? And that's what is going to happen. And I put it to you that you will see this. And when we start to see the population moving and a collective outrage gathering about what has been done to the NHS, that it will be up to people like you to provide some kind of clarity about what the new structures will be. How will it be better run? Can we have a public sector that's more than just the production of money and units of care that are in fact convertible to money anyway? So I suggest that it is the job of citizens across history to control corrupt elites. There's nothing new about it whatsoever. And that that's what we're going to see as we move forward from now. Thank you very much for listening.